Okay, guys, we're going to talk about this is a godsend. We're going to talk about site alignment and site picture. I'm going to kind of go backwards, but you know, I've had a lot of calls in the last week. Um, you know, uh, pastor pastor preached on the love of God uh, last week, and and I had about four texts where where people are like, pastors talking about me, and you know, and and thinking that they're exposed, and I'm like, no, that's the Holy Spirit dealing with your issue, and so. I want to go back to that and I want to talk about storms and I want to talk about overcoming storms. But, you know, the key is site alignment. It's always going to create site pictures. So it's something that uh, your alignment uh, with God is always going to create the picture of purpose for your life. So alignment is always going to be key. And I'm going to use two different scripture verses. Uh, actually, I'm going to use three, but I'm going to use two and I'm going to open up with two. And I want you to see the similarities of the two as far as how Jesus dealt with the impossibilities. And it was actually just two steps how he dealt with it. But I want to show you that he established a model as far as how he dealt with problems when they came into his life. So let me go ahead and let Maurice in here and let me post the notes. So notes are posted. Good morning, Marisa. So let's go to Matthew 6, 23 and 27, or in, in, and it says, suddenly a furious storm came up on the lake so that the waves swept over the boat, but Jesus was sleeping in the boat. You don't have authority over the storm you can't sleep in. The disciples went and woke him saying, Lord, save us, we're going to drown. He replied, you of little faith, why are you so afraid? Highlight that, you of little faith. I'm going to go back and I'm going to touch on that. Then he got up and he rebuked the winds and the waves, and it was completely calm. The men were amazed and asked, what kind of man is this? Even the winds and the waves obey him. So they had a storm. Jesus was asleep. They were fearful of the storm. And I'll get into that, but they were fearful of the storm based on their history of, of their past. They were fearful. Jesus woke up, and with a word, he spoke to the storm, and the wind and the waves obeyed him, and everything was calm, and it was good. Now let's go to the next story, Matthew 17 and 14. When they came to a crowd, this is about the boy that was delivered from epilepsy. When they came, uh, when they came to the crowd, a man approached Jesus and knelt before him. Lord, have mercy on my son, he said. He, he has seizures and is suffering greatly. He often falls into the fire or into the water. I brought him to your disciples, but they fell short. They couldn't heal him. And Jesus said, you unbelieving and perverse generation, how long shall I stay with you? How long shall I put up with you? He, was, he wasn't talking to the crowd. He was talking to the disciples. Disciples been hanging out with Jesus and watching Jesus do amazing things. And Jesus was saying, hey, I don't want you on the bench anymore. I want you in the game. So they were in the game. They fail. And Jesus always establishes a building block. He starts small and he builds from that. And he figured that they were at the level that they could deal with this issue but the father said, hey, your disciples, uh, the guys that everybody's talking about that are doing awesome, that are carrying your anointing, that are carrying your gifting, well, they fell short. So Jesus was a little ticked off here. So he says, how long shall I stay? With you? How long shall I put up with you? And he says, bring the boy here to me. Now watch this. Jesus rebuked the demon, and it came out of the boy, and he was healed at that moment. Then the disciples came to Jesus in private and said, why couldn't we drive it out? He replied, because you have so little faith. Interesting. He dealt with the storm the same way. He said, you know, Lord save us, we're going to drown. He replied, you of little faith. There's something Jesus is communicating. There's an area of lack in your life where you're not picking it up and you're not understanding how to deal with it. He said, because you have so little faith, truly I tell you, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to the mountain, move from here to there, and it will move. Nothing will be impossible for you. So he's saying, I'm trying to teach you how to move in a realm of impossibilities, but the storms of life are stopping you, and they're discouraging you, and they're giving you <coughs> a life of disappointment. And when you live a life of disappointment, you live a life that's focusing on your past, right? Proverbs 13 and 12 says, that hope deferred makes the heart sick, but a desire fulfilled is a tree of life. Now watch this. You've heard me say the message version. Unrelenting disappointment uh, leaves you heart sick, but it says a sudden good break can turn your life around. They're both about focal points. Remember back in Genesis when God spoke to Cain. You know, Cain and Abel came, and they both gave their offering. And Abel was applauded for his offering. 
And God kind of looked down on Cain, you know, for his offering. And God speaks to Cain. He says, why are you so angry? This is in Genesis 4 and I think 8. Why are you so angry? Why has your countenance fallen? And then he says, if you do good, you're emotionally going to feel better. He said, but if you don't do good, then he said, uh, sin is crouching at your door and it desires to have you. And he says, but you must master it. So hold on a sec. So he had an emotional issue. He was heart sick. And God speaks to Cain. He says, I need you to master your emotions because it desires to master you, to rule you, to overtake you. Because if you live life by your emotions, you are going to live a life of failure. Why? Because you're going to live a life responding to the outside, responding to the circumstance, responding to people. You will literally live a life in reaction to every storm in the devil, and you'll never live in response to the Father. And if you do that, you will always miss everything that God has for you because you're basing everything on disappointment, everything on your past, everything on your old wounds, and you're basing everything on your surrounding circumstance. And what are you doing? You're seeing everything through a lens of disappointment based on your past, which is now determining your future. But God doesn't address your past because when we talk about, you know, the love of God and, and, and God says nothing can separate you from the love of God. In, in Romans 8.38, he said, neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons. Watch this. Neither fears for today. So hold on a sec. So. It says the love of God or the fears for today can't separate you from the love of God. And if you're loved by God, that means God's with you, right? It says your fear cannot separate your love from God. So if I have anxiety and if I have depression, it's because I don't understand the love of God for my life. I don't understand the love of self. If I have certain fears that are going on in my life, certain phobias that are going on in my life, I don't clearly have a perception of who I am and how much God loves me. And this is key in any storm in life. I'm going to build up to this. It's going to be a short, you know, short message. But I need you to understand, and I talked about this last week. I need you to understand that Jesus paid the price on the cross for you. Why? You were pierced for, uh, he was pierced for your transgressions. Transgressions of what? Your past, right? He was crushed for your inequity. For what time? For your past. The past four generations, the past gen 10 generations of sexual sin, the chastisement of his peace was upon you. What are you talking about? You were a captive because you believed the lie, you empowered the liar, and you were captive by what people said, by your emotions, by circumstance, and you were held prisoner. A prisoner is a person that has unforgiveness in their heart, and it says that they are bound. So, your past and your circumstance left you walking away with unforgiveness in your heart. And when you walk away with unforgiveness, you are now bound, right? And you are not free. And when you are bound, and when you read the story of, of the, um, uh, the king that, that sent the noble into a prison because he would not, uh, would not forgive, it said that the torturers or the jailers took him. What happened? Grace came off of his life. In the demonic were allowed to torment him and take him into prison based on unforgiveness. It was an unforgiveness of a debt or an obligation that somebody owed him. They would not release him. And all of a sudden, because they would not release him, he stayed attached to the condition and the demonic were allowed to torment them. So what happens when I have anxiety? What happens when I have, you know, a, a, a depression? There are issues in my life that I have not forgiven. I have not severed those ties. Therefore, the demonic is allowed to torment me, and I have unrelenting disappointment going in my heart because I'm still attached to the things of my past. But it said neither the fears for today, watch this, nor the worries about tomorrow. Well, Matthew 6 and 25 deals with worry. And how does it deal with worry? It says, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. What is he saying? How do you de deal with worry? You don't worry about your past because you don't think about it. You, you think about the future based on the promise and things that God has for you, but that's all based on alignment. So when I align with God, and righteousness is a legal term where I'm obedient to the laws of God, 
when I'm obedient, I'm in alignment and the rights and privileges are guaranteed by the king. So if I'm in alignment with God, then I have no worries. Why? Because I'm a citizen of the kingdom. God's rights and privileges are protected by him so I can move in kingdom things without worrying about my past because the promise has already determined my future, right? So now look at this. Neither the fears for today, so God deals with today, nor the worries about tomorrow, so God deals with tomorrow. Not even the powers of hell can separate us from the love of God. So what does God not mention? He doesn't mention your past. What? He talks about you being in love today and you being in love tomorrow, but he doesn't deal with the issue of your past, right? So yesterday cannot remove you from the love of God, but what can it do? It can shut down your awareness of God, right? So your disappointment is always attached to yesterday, and God is saying grace and mercy are renewed today. Focus on today. Worry is about tomorrow, but understand if you're loved, then God, because he loved you, is taking care of tomorrow. That's why it says in Matthew 6, 34, it says, do not worry about tomorrow. Tomorrow will take care of itself. What is it saying? God is going to show up in your tomorrow. Focus on the grace and the opportunities that God has given you today. Don't worry about your past. Don't think about your past. Don't, don't, you know, you got to separate yourself from the past. But if God isn't focused on your past, then you shouldn't focus on him either. Yes, you need to forgive, and yes, you need to sever every tie, every entanglement, every attachment to your past, but you need to live in today, and you need to live towards tomorrow based on the promise of God for your life. So it, the disappointment speaks to your past, not to your present, and not to your future. So when we think about our past, like I said, you have lingering unforgiveness, you have lingering sin issues, you have lingering failures that you haven't addressed. And you're allowing your emotional state of disappointment to determine your future. And when you get in that rut, it becomes a stronghold. Remember I said through repetition, uh, a stronghold is created through repetition. It's repetitious thoughts, 2 Corinthians uh, 10, 3 through 5. It's repetitious thoughts or coping mechanisms in the natural people always use to ward out evil. But when we continue to go back to the same thought process, we, through repetition, are building these the the blocks for a demonic stronghold in our lives and it's a place that violates trust in god so i put on point four unrelenting disappointment makes a heart sick so the enemy keeps you focused on what did not work so you are unaware or you're kept in a place of what could work if you don't know how to strengthen yourself in the place of failure you will not be able to rebound to experience the life that god has for you and you have to understand it's never god's fault anytime there's error it's always going to be on our end right? Because God's already given us, given us the promises. And I'm going to get into that. But if there's an error, and I noticed this in praying for the sick, when, when we started making, you know, uh, progress and praying for the sick at the altar, you know, we first started getting words and knowledge and we started praying for the sick. All of a sudden, you know, we started running into these problems of deliverance. Well, I didn't really have all the information on deliverance. So I went back to God and prayed about it. And, and God told me to sign up for a class. So I signed up for a class on deliverance. So now we're making breakthrough and deliverance, but I still had issues because once we got people delivered, I understood that there was heart issues with inner healing where strongholds in, in habitation in the hearts of people had to come down, but I didn't have the tools for that. And then God goes, get on a plane and fly yourself down to Florida. And that's why I call God Jehovah Sneaky because I ended up signing up for a deliverance seminar, not realizing how many issues I had in my heart. So I had to deal with my own issues. Once I was able to experience, you know, uh, the, the redemption that God had for me based on the sins of my past, I was able to now, because I had the authority, deliver people from theirs. But it was a process. So what happened? Every time I failed, I went back to God. And when I went back to God, I asked God, I said, what do I need to do about this? And God would give me direction as far as what I needed to do. And what did I have to do? I had to listen to God. I had to get a word. I had to take that instruction and take a risk and actually apply it. Sometimes I got breakthrough. Sometimes I failed. But when I failed, I went right back to God. I said, God, where am I missing you? Right now, watch this. I've been called to several things. And there's sometimes where I felt like, Ugh, you know, God, I'm missing it in here. You call me to this thing. It doesn't feel like I'm flourishing in it. But where am I missing it? Because your promise isn't wrong. You spoke. You gave me grace. But somehow I'm missing it in this thing. God, where am I missing it? And that's the place where I'd go to in prayer 
And I'd ask the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, show me where my grace is in this thing, because I feel like I'm missing it. And I want to be aware of your redemptive nature in this thing. And I want to be able to get through this storm. I want to be able to deal with this issue. But I just feel like I'm caught up in this issue over and over and over again. And I don't know how to get through it. And that's the place I listen to the voice of the Holy Spirit. Now, understand, I talk about unrelenting disappointment that makes the heart sick, right? So, and if it's not God's fault, and I'm supposed to align with God, well, John 3 and 8 says, watch this. I'm talking about a storm. It says, the wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear it sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it's going. Watch this. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. So he's talking about Acts 17 and 20. It says, in him we live, we move, and we have our being. It's talking about an alignment. And it's saying when we align with God, we live, we move, and we have our being. We have that sense of purpose, right? Because we're moving in purpose. Now watch this. Sailboats are designed to navigate through adverse winds. Did you hear me? Sailboats are designed to navigate through adverse winds. We are on a sailboat, but the Holy Spirit in his breath gives us the direction through the storm. So when we listen to the prophetic and in, in, in um, uh, Second Corinthians, I think it's First Corinthians 2 and 12, where it says the Holy Spirit reveals to us all things, transferring the resources of his world into ours, what he's doing is he's speaking a word from God to give us an instruction in the midst of a storm to be able to navigate through it. It's not that God doesn't wants to control us. It's that God understands there's still a fallen nature here in this world that has not been redeemed, redeemed by the cross of Jesus because of people. And he's saying because of those people, there are traps, there are snares, there are landmines that God says in the middle of this storm, there is grace available. And I'm going to steer you in that grace through my voice, through my breath, and you and I, through alignment, are going to be able to get through this thing. But understand, storms always reveal your weakness. Storms always reveal your weakness. And what does that do? When you're in a place of weakness, you have to know where to apply your faith. Faith is always going to gird your place in weakness, and it's going to make it strong. So a storm is actually a good thing because it shows you where you're deficient. It shows you what hasn't truly been redeemed by God. Otherwise, it'd be a strength. And because that's not an awareness in the middle of a storm, and that storm continues to persist, it's making you aware of it so you can do something about it because you have all the tools, you just don't know how to use your equipment. So we will progress to the next thing. Children always reveal their father. Genesis 3 and 15, and I'm going to tie this all together here real soon. Genesis 3 and 15, as soon as Adam and Eve fell, through disobedience. As soon as they fell, God immediately turns around and says, and I'm going to put enmity between you and the woman. So he says, I'm going to create separation. You're going to hate the enemy. The enemy is going to hate you. That's going to be the separation. You are going to, and that's the purpose of renouncing. You are now opposition. The enemy is now your enemy, right? So he says, I'm going to put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He's going to crush your head and you're going to strike his heel. He's talking about Jesus, but he's also talking about the children of God after Jesus, right? So as soon as they fell, what did God do? He issued a promise. Interesting. And I'm going to tell you why. So there was a promise waiting for Adam and Eve so they could be forgiven of their past and they could be healed or redeemed to fulfill their sense of purpose. So did you hear me? When we're dealing with disappointment and we're dealing with the past, God has a promise to redeem you as quickly as possible. Why? So you could fulfill your assignment. Psalm 139 and 16 said your life was ordained by God. And he wrote down every day of your life before one of them came to pass. So God has a, a, a future already predetermined for you. But what he's saying is, <clears throat> I need you to overcome this situation in the storm as quickly as possible. And I have a promise waiting for you so you could quickly grab hold of it and you can navigate through your storm. So if you're in a place of storms, then God already has a promise for you. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to chase this down a little bit further. So like I said, hope deferred can make your heart sick. And I said, but desire realizes a tree of life. So you can't eat from the tree of life. That's why Adam and Eve were kicked out of the garden. You can't live from the tree of life because it was eternal life. And if they did eat from that tree of life in a place of sin, they would be eternally a sinner and they would have no hope or redemption. 
Well, God needs to redeem you to, watch this, to fulfill your purpose. And if you fulfill your purpose and you reflect the nature of God, right, when you break through the impossibilities of life, you reflect the nature of the Father. The Father, God is known as the Father. And we have to understand, children always reveal the Father. The Father doesn't just reveal himself. It's his goodness towards the children of God that gives him glory. When you get breakthrough, when you get a healing, what happens? It exposes the nature of God. When you get a financial breakthrough, what does it do? It exposes the nature of a father. When you get a new job, when you get a new assignment, and it's it's good, what does it do? It exposes the nature of a good father. And we have to remember that, that our desire is always connected to an eternal purpose to fulfill our dreams and our purpose. So God is not going to give us promises uh, just to entice us, but to inspire us and to instill us in our capacity to be able to dream. Now, we know that when a storm hits our life, the storm's job in life is to point out our deficiencies. But we also know that the storm could bring in hopelessness. And what happens? Capacity is the room in our heart to have hope or to be hopeless. And it affects how you're going to perceive everything because within your heart is insight and it has an inner lens of how you're going to view all things, right? So the promises are the invitation of God into a relational journey where together we labor to see things happen on earth that are going to reveal his nature, right? So we know that God has chosen in the beginning to work through the sons and daughters of God. And he has to work through the sons and daughters of God because it's the children that expose God as the father, that children in the goodness of God that expose God to the father. So God has a motive. I have to redeem and restore you with my goodness because it reveals him working in and through your life, breaking through the impossibilities that turn all eyes towards him and Jesus to show him that he's a good father, right? So God can't reveal his own nature. A child must do it. And the well-being of a child proves the goodness of a father. Now watch this, Romans 8, 14. For those who are led by the Spirit of God are what? They're children of God. So if they're led by the Spirit of God, and I said, in him we live, we move, and have our being, based on our alignment, we can get through any storm, right? Because if we are moved by the Spirit of God and we're in alignment with God, we can navigate through anything. Hebrews 1 and 3 says, Jesus is the exact representation of the Father. So Jesus didn't do anything. He didn't say anything unless the Father did it. Who revealed the Father? Jesus did, right? And then Jesus said, as the Father has sent me, I'm sending you. Think about this. Now you qualify. This is John 20 and 21. He said, as the Father has sent me, I am sending you. So you're commissioned, right? Each one of you here online, you're all commissioned. And Jesus is now saying, as the Father has sent me, I'm sending you. Why is God sending you? So he can not only redeem you, which he has, but he can do good works in your life so you now can reveal the Father. So God has an interest in your success to get you through the storms, to work with you to breaking, breaking through the impossibilities, to heal your body. Why? So you can tell people when it manifests in your life about a good father that has restored you, that has redeemed you, that, that is, is, is speaking to you, that is releasing, you know, the inheritances in your life. So you can be able, uh, so you can be able to uh, fulfill your assignment. So God is going to answer your prayer based on the word of God coming out of your mouth. So he can prove himself himself, not only in your life, but in the lives of people around you. So the question is, are you going to look at the promise or the problem when it comes in your life? Now watch this. I said when Adam and Eve fell, God immediately responded to a promise, right? Now remember when I first opened up how Jesus dealt with the epileptic, how Jesus dealt with the storm, but I'm going to build on this. Second Corinthians 1 and 18, it says, but surely as God is faithful, our message to you is not yes and no. For the Son of God, Jesus Christ, who is preached among you uh, by us, by me, and Silas and Timothy, was not yes and no, but in him it has always been yes. Watch this. For no matter how many promises God has made, they are yes in Christ. And so through him, the amen is spoken to us by the glory of God. So God says when his promises are yes, 
He's saying you don't even have to ask me for them. What do you have to do? You have to come in alignment. Amen means I'm in agreement. So all you have to do is find the promise, come in agreement with it, and appropriate it. That means take ownership over it. And God says, I'm behind you. I've already issued my promise. Some people say, well, God issued 7,700 uh, 7, promises from humanity to, to, uh, to, from God to humanity. I think I looked up on Google, 7,487 promises in total in the Bible. I think there's like 8,500. Bottom line is there are thousands of promises from God to humanity that you have access to. And, and what is this saying? For no matter how many promises God had made, they're already available to you. You just have to be aware of them. You have to be able to appropriate them, and you have to be able to walk in them. And I'm going to take it a little bit further. And it says, now it is God who makes both us and you stand firm in Christ. He has anointed us, set a seal of ownership on us, and he's put his spirit in our hearts as a deposit, guaranteeing what is to come. How does God, by his spirit, guarantee what is, is to come? When the spirit of God is within you, right, in 1 Corinthians 2 and 12, it says that he speaks what's in the mind of Christ into your mind, into your heart, transferring the resources of his world into your world. So he's saying when the spirit of God is in you, then he can guarantee the promise because he stands behind his word to perform it, Jeremiah 1 and 12. So watch this. Before you had a problem or you even believed in a promise, God already determined the yes, it's available. Think about this. Your storm that hit your life did not catch God off guard. It caught you off guard. But because it caught you off guard, God is saying that there's already a promise available for your life. All you need to do is align with. Okay. And we have to understand through him, a man is spoken to us by the glory of God. So I find the promise. I come in agreement with it. And the father decrees a promise. He's waiting for an amen or someone who is coming into alignment with him. So we go back to Matthew 6, 33, and we have to seek first, you know, his kingdom, his righteousness, through alignment, and we have to align with his agenda to see how he's going to change yours. Did you hear me? We have to align with his agenda, his promise, to see how he's going to change yours. So we have to find the promise, and what does the promise say about your life? What is the predetermined outcome to your situation? If it's a healing issue, how many scriptures are on healing? If, if it's a prayer issue, what about breakthrough? If it's a deliverance issue based on your hardship, based on poverty, based on sickness, what does the Bible say about that? What are the promises of, of, of God concerning that, right? So we have to go and we have to find the promises. So when we suffer loss, it matters enough to us to cry out to God so we can have breakthrough so this issue does not happen again. How many storms of the same type do you want to have happen? Can I, can I give you a word? I'm going to anyways. A lot of times there are repetitive issues that happen in our life and we think, well, I fail in business. Well, then I, I point the blame onto this person, this person, and this person. Then it happens again. Now I'm pointing it to this person, this person, and this person. Guess what? The issues and the storms that you're dealing with are going to persist until you get a promise for breakthrough for your life. So a lot of times, you know, I, I, I look back, I had multiple girlfriends before getting saved. And every single one, I'd say it's their issue, their issue, their issue, their issue. But I would never get through the issue because it was always easy to blame that other person. And I quickly realized God is going to continue to bring me people in my life. But if I don't get beyond my issue, it doesn't matter the people that I'm dealing with. It's always going to be the same storm. Eventually, I got to deal with my own issue and I got to take ownership over that issue. And it's not somebody else's fault. Usually it's my perception of it. And usually it's because I'm not in alignment with the promise because I'm in alignment with the problem, right? And so what happens when I align with the problem? I speak the problem. And what happens? Whatever I decide to decree upon anything, God says it'll be established. So I'm establishing good or evil based on the words that are coming out of my mouth. So internal realities are always going to manifest externally, right? Because I have authority over all things. And all things spiritual are going to respond to my voice. And spirits will respond to the speed of my voice to create the very thing that I'm speaking into existence. So the question is, what am I in alignment with? So when I suffer a problem, I go back to God and I'm honest with God. Oh my God, how do I deal with this issue? Because I don't want this problem to continue to persist. I want by your spirit to maneuver through this thing because I understand my promised land is on the other side of this storm. 
I just need to get to the other side, but I need breakthrough. So I have to keep going back and forth with God. I have to keep listening to the promises, keep speaking the promises, and I have to continue to take risks until I hit breakthrough. So Bill Johnson said, you may not like your assignment, but it doesn't give you the right to change it. There's many times when I went to work in the morning with Pinnacle Restoration that I didn't like the assignment. I didn't like the word that God gave me. Why? Because it dealt with my weaknesses. The business God had called me to dealt with my weaknesses, not my strengths. But there's a realm in God where God spoke to me and he gave me the grace to fulfill it. And I just had to find the promises that back me up. You know, Exodus 31, 2 and 3, I talked about this. When the Spirit of God comes upon you, it comes upon you in the form of wisdom as a craftsman to be able to make things. And that was the word that I needed in order to start Pinnacle Restoration. I had to continue speaking things. Now, I've gotten better at, at, at working, but I'm a much better owner than I am an employee, right? But I'm learning the trades. You know, I'm working with, with, with my brother-in-law, but I'm working in trades with people smarter than me. And I don't always get it right, and but I'm willing to learn from other people's gifts, right? So it was a place of weakness. But if I never decided to start this business called Pinnacle Restoration, watch this. I would have never met a Rita Bennett who had a backflow in her sewer. And she was key in plugging me into the inner healing aspect of deliverance. So if I wasn't obedient to the word, now watch this. You got to take the principle away. If I wasn't obedient to this difficult word that dealt with my weakness, I would have never gone to the next level of ministry. Why? Because if I didn't step through that door, I wouldn't have met Rita Bennett. And inner healing is, is half of deliverance. So there is a ministry that I could not have brought to the church if I wasn't obedient to the thing that I didn't feel qualified for. So if God has spoken you certain things in your life, I said this last week, you don't need a second word. You don't need a third word. You don't need a fourth word. If God spoke it, he released the grace for you. You just have to go back to that grace. And if you're not hitting it out of the park, you got to go back to God and say, God, where's my issue? Don't focus on anybody else. God, where's my issue in this thing? And how do I correct it? Because if I'm failing in this thing and you call me to it, God, you're not a liar. And you've given me grace for this thing. But obviously, I'm not seeing it. Where is it in me that I'm missing it? And God, how do you correct this thing in me so I can get through this storm? A lot of people, when I when I post anything about forgiveness, it's the Christian F word. I get fewer likes when I put a word of forgiveness in there because people want to be better, not better, right? And 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 we have to understand that forgiveness breaks every tie, entanglement, and attachment to your life, and it literally sets the captives free and releases the prisoners from darkness. So I'm going to go ahead and wrap this thing up. Jesus said concerning the promises. And this is the message version. I've said this verse many times, but I like it. So in Matthew 13 and 52 in the message, it says, then you'll see how every student well-trained in God's kingdom is, they're like the owner of a general store. Watch this. A child in the kingdom of God, and if you hit a storm or somebody else hits a storm, it says every student well-trained in God's kingdom is like the owner of a general store who can put their hands on anything they need old or new exactly when you need it it says anything anything you need god says is available through his promise but will you appropriate it or will you declare the problem or the promise right it says everything you need is already in his word for you to fulfill your assignment the question is what's the word for you what's the word for this season right so let's go my last point is i put the biggest in the little matthew 6 23 and 27 now, I started with these two things. I'm going to say them again, and I'm going to show you the points as far as getting through your storm, and, and we're done. Matthew 6, 23 through 27, suddenly a furious storm came up on the lake. And the reason I'm saying it now, because now it's probably going to change your perception of the story. Suddenly a furious storm came up on the lake, so that waves swept over the boat, but Jesus was sleeping. The disciples went and woke him, saying, Lord, save us. We're going to drown. He replied, you have little faith. Why are you so afraid? Then he got up and he rebuked the winds and the waves, and it was completely calm. The rebuking is key. The men were amazed and asked, what kind of man is this? Even the winds and waves obeyed him. Cool. Let's go to the next one. Matthew 17, 14. When they came to the crowd, a man approached Jesus and knelt before him. 
Lord, have mercy on my son. It's a what epileptic boy. He said he has seizures and he is suffering greatly. He often falls into the fire and into the water. I brought him to your disciples, but they could not heal him. You unbelieving and perverse generation, Jesus replied, how long shall I stay with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring the boy here to me. Jesus rebuked the demon, and it came out of the boy, and he was healed at that moment. Then the disciples came to Jesus in private and asked, why couldn't we drive it out? He replied, because you have so little faith. That's the answer. Truly, I tell you, if faith, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move. Nothing will be impossible. So there's no impossibility if you have a promise in the midst of a problem. But the big is always in the little. So understand in both stories, they came to Jesus and they asked Jesus, why did we fail? And Jesus said, because of the littleness of your faith. So here's what happens when you run into somebody. And, and, and I'll tell you this, five years into my Christianity was not long. I raised a paralyzed guy out of bed. He had a he had suffered a stroke. He woke up paralyzed completely on the left side. My father-in-law, Mark, who uh, Derek was the one that was paralyzed. Derek worked for Crown Mayflower Moving. I got Derek a job with my father-in-law who was working at Crown Mayflower Moving. He was working in the marketing department. And about 11 o'clock that morning, he had been paralyzed for two weeks. Mark basically was going to the hospital to see, hey, Derek, how are you doing? Hey, Derek, by the way, uh, I can't keep you on. I got to fire you because, you know, we got to move on. And it looks like you're going to be paralyzed for the rest of your life. So we don't know what to do. That was about 11 o'clock in the morning. And Mark told me after when he was talking to Derek, Derek had, because he paralyzed on the left, to put his hand behind his head, he had to grab his hand and do that and put his hand behind his head. And he can only grab one kid at a time, you know, with, with his right arm. Well, one o'clock is when I walked in. And at one o'clock, God gave me a word. And I went in there with Jimmy and we prayed for him and it didn't work. And then I said, God, I said, watch this. I said, God, why is this not working? Think about this. God, why is this not working? And what did God say? He said, it's in the right side of his head. I did not know the right side of your brain controlled the left side of your body. Not, not a doctor. Don't know these things. He said, put your hand on the right side of his head. As soon as I did, he started shaking. I was holding him on the bed because he shook so bad. In the left side of his body, his right arm shot up. His left leg shot up. And I was like, holy crap, he's healed. And there was so much emotion and the healing was so intense. He immediately, he, he cried and boom, he was out. And I looked over at Jimmy and I'm like, oh my God, he got healed. And so we walked out. So what happened with me is a gift of faith came on me. I didn't believe for, for, for that, but this gift of faith, uh, 1 Corinthians 12, it's in uh, 8 through 10. The gift of faith came on me and hit me. And I believe the impossible because God's faith partnered with my faith. And all of a sudden I see this freaky miracle. But a lot of times I don't tell the first part of the story. I prayed the first time and it didn't happen. Right. And why didn't it happen? Because God had a promise in the midst of that. He had an instruction for me and I missed it. And so immediately I know that God is going to heal him because otherwise I wouldn't be there. He laid there two weeks paralyzed. Everybody prayed for him, didn't get healed. So all of a sudden I'm in the middle of this problem and I asked God, and I didn't think God was going to speak. I said, God, where's the problem? He said, it's on the right side of his brain. I didn't even pray when I put my hand on his head. All I did, God said, put your hand on the right side of his head. As soon as I did, his whole body started vibrating. So you mean in the middle of your problem, there was an instruction? Yes, I missed it the first time. But what did I do? I stayed in my problem until I got the promise. Think about this. I stayed in my problem until I got the promise. And what was the end result? Now watch this. The disciples failed in the boat. They failed with the epileptic boy. And they said, Jesus, why did we fail? He said, because you have little faith. Now watch this. He said, you have little faith. Now littleness, look it up in the strongest concordance. You'll see in the Greek, it means it's, it's oligos. In both texts, it's oligos for the littleness of faith. Now, what does that mean? It means a short time or a brief moment. So hold on a sec. So Jesus said, the reason you failed is because you stayed in faith only for a brief moment. That's the reason for your failure. But then he validates that. He said, we're talking time, not quantity. We're talking time. He said, because you didn't stay in it long enough. Well, God, why is my relationship failing? 
because you didn't stay in it long enough. You didn't figure out the problem. You immediately ran. And I have grace for you. God, why is my business family? Because you didn't stay in it long enough to get the solution. God, you know, why is, you know, the, the issues with my kids, my finances, why is everything failing? And he's saying, because of your littleness of faith. And what he's saying is you did not stay in your problem long enough. Instead, you gave it no escapism and you ran. And guess what? You're still going to deal with the storm. You can keep running and God is going to keep hitting the reset button, but you will continue to hit, hit that wall of impossibility until you stay in your problem long enough to get a promise to stay into that thing and break through it. It doesn't matter what it is. It's not people's issue. It's your issue, right? So when he's saying it's the littleness of faith, he validates it in Luke. He said, when they said, why couldn't we drive it out? He said, because you have so little faith. So you didn't stay in faith long enough. That's why the kid still has seizures. You laid hands on him. He hit the ground. He manifested. Do you know how many demons have told me you don't have the authority to drive me out? Well, I know the enemy is a liar and the father lies and lying is his natural tongue. And what he's really saying is you have all authority to drive me out. Now I'm freaking out. Why? Because the thing that was inside in darkness is being driven out by the light and by the Holy Spirit. And now it's manifesting and it's speaking to me because it was hidden. And all of a sudden he hits the ground. He starts shank, shaking, says, you don't have enough faith. I've heard that one so many times. You don't have the faith to drive me out. And I've corrected even the demonic. And I said, you've interpreted the correct, the text incorrectly. It says that littleness is about time. And I got all the time in the world. I'm eternal and I have the grace and you're going to go. So it didn't discourage me because the demonic were misinterpreting scripture. The religious misinterpret scripture. It's saying stay in your problem long enough to get a promise and apply the promise in the midst of your problem. And you will see that God will confirm the words spoken by signs and wonders following Mark 16, 20 and Jeremiah 1 and 12. God will perform his work. God will watch over it and see it's fulfilled. Psalms 103 and 20 says the angels of the Lord hearken to the word of the Lord and they perform it. So they listen for the word of God coming out of your mouth in the angels that are assigned to your life go to work for you to break through the impossible. Now watch this. It says Jesus rebuked the wind and rebuked the demon in order to get breakthrough. What is rebuking? Well, he rebuked it with a word. What was the word? The word was the promise in the midst of the problem. So not only did Jesus stay in faith because he stayed in the problem until he had breakthrough, he corrected the problem in both situations. There you go. With a word. What was the word? The word was a promise. Jesus' name is the word of God, Revelation 19, 13. So his name is the word of God. So Jesus corrected the problem with a promise from God, right, into the situation, and we have to understand that a rebuking assigns value to the problem. You better hear me. A rebuking assigns value to the problem. So when I have a promise and I know the outcome and I come into a difficult situation, when it says Jesus rebuked the demon and he rebuked the storm, it said he corrected it with the promise and the promise gave the problem value, which was no value. Did you hear me? The reason storms exist in your life is because you name them, you give them purpose, you give them value, you think about it, you speak it, you recreate the very thing that your, your, your affection is anchored in. And God said in both texts, when he rebuked it, he gave it value. The promise gives it value, but we don't know who we are. Did you hear me? We don't know who we are. So we're kind of speaking the word, but we really don't believe it. And God is saying, stay in faith in this thing. Continue to speak the word. Understand that the promise of God continues to devalue and de-escalate every single storm. But we have to give value to a storm. Your storm doesn't bother me. Your addiction doesn't bother me. Why? Because I understand its value. The question is, do you? Do you understand the value of your problems in life? Because the promise from a, from a child of God will predetermine the value of every single storm. The question is, will you align with God? Will you see the problem that God sees it? And, and would you release the promise that's available in your life to de-escalate the storm so you can remove the, the problem you can move through it and get into the promise on the other side of your life.
Now remember, when every, whenever a problem comes in your life, rulers decree, they don't work. And we have to understand in Hebrews that we're called to enter into a place of rest. So faith is exercised from rest. Why? Because I'm seated in heavenly places. I'm seated with him. That means I'm a ruler. I'm tapped into the grace of God in the third heaven. I'm responding to the second heaven demonic reality while my physical body is here in the first, he first heaven, trust or realm. So I'm connected in the spirit and I'm in the first heaven and I'm in the third heaven all at once. And I speak what heaven is speaking <coughs> over the situation the, my kingdom come, that will be done on earth as is him. So I'm creating a, a heavenly reality through the kingdom of God here on earth, and I'm changing it. But because I'm exercising it from a place of rest, that means I'm trusting in God. I'm resting in God. I'm seated with him in God, seated with him in heavenly places. But it says that rulers decree. So if a ruler decrees, and I got to go back to Job 22 and 28, it says, whatsoever I de decide and decree, upon a thing, God says he'll establish it. So he's looking to create things here in this planet through the children of God so the children could display the nature of a good father. And God has a will and is so driven to redeem you out of your situation so when you get out of it, everybody will look at you and say, well, shoot, you're not that good. There's got to be a real God. There's got to be a good father. Why? Because it's manifesting in your life, right? So I'm not going to beat a dead horse. But when you run into a storm, know that it's exposing a weakness. Know that God already has a promise. You don't have to ask him. You appropriate it. And when I appropriate it, means I own it and I decree it without asking for permission. Did you hear me? I appropriate it without asking permission. And the promise will always rebuke the enemy in every storm by giving it value. And it's insignificant because the enemy left all authority when they were cast down from heaven, Jude 1 and 6. And they're cast here in the earth in, the, in eternal darkness. They have no authority except by the authority that you give it. So we don't give every problem authority by naming it, by speaking it, by continuing to acknowledge it over and over because you're watering it. And you're allowing it to continually build a stronghold in your life. Continue to feed the promise. Feed on the promise and continue to release the promise and never acknowledge your problem again. I'm not saying that it does not exist. Faith doesn't deny a problem exists. It just gives it a, it, it doesn't give it a place of influence in your life, right? So we cannot give the problem a place of influence. When I tell somebody to change something in their life and, you know, and, and they're like, well, I'm just going to stop drinking. Well, drinking is still the focus. What I need you to do is focus on the grace and promise of God that's available for your life, right? So we live by the spirit, not the, the lust of the flesh. In order for change to be created, you have to change your diet, meaning you have to change what you consume and what you take in on a daily basis. And when I start feeding one thing, then the addiction, the alcohol, the anxiety will no longer be fed. Why? Because I'm no longer giving it power. I'm reestablishing, and I talked about this last week, about a reticular activating system in your brain or about algorithms on the internet. I'm reestablishing thought, thought patterns in my mind. When I reestablish a promise in my life, I'm now forming a new neural pathway, which makes it easier for me to think about the pro promise over my problem. Scientifically, it's proven to work. Spiritually, the word of God says it will work, Romans 12 and 2 right? So we have to understand every situation that we're dealing with, deal with one problem at a time, one storm at a time. You now are equipped to deal with it, but get a promise that aligns with it and stand up and declare it as an owner of it. Don't beg God for it. He already gave it to you. It's already yes in him. Don't beg God for it. Appropriate the promise as a ruler seated in heavenly places and tell that thing what it's going to do by way of promise and stand back and watch for your answer. It may not happen the first day, the second day. But the Bible says, if you speak to the mountain with little faith, and little faith is persistent faith, it said your problem is going to move and your possibility will give way to the possibility of God, right? We have to be able to stay in this thing. We have to own our stuff. We have to address it. We have to speak to it. And God says it will move. He'll confirm it. He'll perform it in his time. 
but do not allow the problem to be empowered in your life or persist any longer. Stand up and fight, right? Stand up and fight. You have the word, which is your sword. And do not tolerate evil any longer. When we don't know how to fight evil, we become dismissive of it. Do not tolerate it and say it's not that bad. Start dealing with your issue. Amen. So, guys, I'm going to go ahead and, and I'm going to pray you out. But let me go ahead and stop the recording. And.